So I want to try to uh, unpack, describe the relationship between two sort of research projects that uh, at first glance would seem to have nothing whatsoever to do with each other. On the one hand, uh, you know, I just watched this interview between uh, the YouTube uh, atheist Thunderfoot and the uh, physicist um, Lawrence Krauss. And Krauss was, uh, was talking about uh, physics and uh, the technologies, the, the instruments that are required to conduct science nowadays. Um, you know, particle accelerators and rovers and uh, <clears throat> international space stations and these sorts of things. And uh, he said something really interesting, which was that he does expect that we will find life elsewhere in the universe, either extinct life or still living sort of micro, you know, bacterial life or some sort of microorganisms. And he thinks they'll even be related to us and that, you know, life could have traveled between planets. Uh, you know, there are particles, um, asteroids raining down on us that came from Mars um, all the time, right? So we, he said, we humans could in fact be Martians. I thought that's, that was really interesting. But so anyways, there's, there's this one form of research, um, namely, you know, astrophysics, s physical cosmology, uh, particle physics, whatever you want to call it, the study of, of what's outside of us you know, of the environment out there, space or space-time, um, the expanding universe and all of this. And then on the other hand, there's this other research project that I think is just as interesting and fascinating. Um, and and that's sort of the, the realms of um, what's called inner space. Uh, you know, the human psyche, the interior depths uh, of our experience, um, our daily waking experience, our dreaming experience, our experience of deep sleep, our experience of birth, our experience of death, right? And uh, I think just like in the study of external physical, uh, the external physical world, um, the study of the internal psychological world has instruments and technologies or techniques that grant access, uh, you know, to the deeper reaches of, of this realm. Um, and one of the most powerful techniques that we currently have um, are psychedelic uh, chemicals. Um, these are the true alchemical substances, uh, in my opinion that uh, unlock our perception and our thinking um, and that transform um, philosophy in a very fundamental way so that you know the standard sort of enlightenment understandings of empiricism and logic and, and rationality and um, you know what it means to to be a human being uh, capable of doing theoretical work, you know, science, um, the, all of these ideas that we inherit from sort of enlightenment philosophy, basically Kant and Hume and all of the thinkers surrounding them, um, this is, this picture is destroyed or at least um, put into perspective in an entirely unexpected way by the psychedelic experience uh, and, you know, also by uh, you know, other sort of methods that allow us to peer into the psyche, like uh, depth psychology, you know, starting with really German idealists like Schelling, uh, <clears throat> and later Freud, of course, and Jung, and Adler, uh, and well, even before these, these guys, Nietzsche, uh, there was this discovery made of the unconscious, the human unconscious, um, which kind of brought the enlightenment human down to size, down to earth. And I think psychedelics, you know, um, psilocybin, LSD, DMT, 
uh, cannabis in its own way, these sorts of substances um, transform our consciousness such that this whole dichotomy between an external world, a physical universe out there, and an internal world, a psychological uh, you know, realm in here, that whole dichotomy dissolves. And instead, what you're left with is, you know, well, really, you, you begin to experience the anima mundi. And there's no longer a boundary between your own thoughts and the events taking place in the outside world. Imagination, in some sense, becomes reality. And imagination here is no longer, you know, a faculty possessed by the human. Um, rather, imagination possesses us. Imagination is just as much... Uh, responsible for bringing forth the so-called environment as it is for the, the so-called soul, you know, the substance that, uh, the mental substance that Descartes and Kant and these people thought they were. Um, you know, Descartes thought he was a, a mental substance in a way different than Kant, or justified it differently, but still, they were trying to justify that understanding of what human beings are as a radically separate, uh, you know, sort of autonomous soul over and against a, an external mechanical world out there. Um, I think it's not that psychedelics show us that, uh, you know, the world is, is a figment of our imaginations, you know, or like our, our personal fantasies. Um, I think you know, rather they force us to, uh, you know, confront our personal fantasies as, like, um, projections, but that behind these personal fantasies there's a collective unconscious, which isn't only collective in the sense of being inherited from other human beings in the course of human history, but in the sense of being inherited from other beings, other organisms, um, other forms of existence, other modes of life. So, you know, part of the unconscious, which doesn't mean, you know, it can't be experienced. Certainly we can have unconscious experience, but part of that unconscious that you can unleash uh, as a result of, of, you know, any number of psychedelics is, you know, inheriting the energy of of stars so that you know stars become our ancestors just as much as um, you know the uh, homo sapiens that first left Africa or the microorganisms that first sprang into life um, in the shallow seas of the primordial earth were related to you know there's our DNA contains the information written into this universe at the very first instant that, that you know, so-called inflation began to take place at the Big Bang, the primordial flaring forth, as Brian Swim prefers to call it. Um, and of course, I also just read earlier today that uh, the inflationary model of the cosmos is being called into question. Um, apparently, there was an announcement a few months ago about gravitational waves being detected from the initial, um, you know, inflationary ex explosion, so-called. Um, but this this finding has been looked into more, and it turns out that uh, it's a, it's an anomaly. No gravity waves were detected, and so the inflationary model is well, I guess, where it was before the original announcement. Um, unconfirmed, but uh, kind of the best thing going, full of, you know, sort of epicyclic ad hoc additions that correct the model as a result of refined observations over the course of the last 40, 30 or 40 years, I think. But it's clear that um, we're missing a big part of the picture and, you know, certainly something like a singularity underlies the apparently um, multiple, uh, you know, expanse of the physical world, but uh, exactly how we emerged from it 
remains unclear. Um, so, you know, this, the process of science is always open-ended, right? And I think part of what the psychedelic experience forces upon you is this recognition that um, to think of science as though it were trying to uh, uncover an objective sort of pre-given material world out there um, is to reify it, is to sort of focus only on the products of science and to totally background the process of science, which is always open-ended. Science is constantly correcting itself. And I think, you know, this evidence of the Big Bang model being, you know, potentially uh, at the end of its paradigmatic uh, life is, is evidence of this sort of open-endedness of science, right? And that our relationship to the universe is one of an ongoing sort of creative, uh, co-creative, um, you know, mutual existence. So it's not like there is a truth about the world out there that we have to sort of uh, theoretically construct at second hand by a scientific, uh, you know, sort of mathematical apparatus or giant technological instrument, you know, rather with all of these instruments and, and with our math mathematics and with our, you know, creative imaginations, we not only come into relationship with the universe that was there in some sense before us or without us, I mean, I'm not trying to deny the existence of the outside world, but rather when we, when we theorize about the universe, when we engage the speculative imagination and attempt to come to terms with the whole of things, we're actually participating with the whole of things, with the universe, in recreating itself. So that, you know, once the universe has been known, the universe is no longer what it was prior to being known. There has been, a, uh, you know, knowledge, scientific knowledge is an evolutionary achievement of the whole of the universe. Right? That's, that's kind of where we end up here. So, you know, where it might have seemed that uh, physics and um, sort of psychedelic psychology have nothing to do with one another. Uh, after a deeper look, maybe, maybe you'll agree with me that actually this process of, you know, um, deepening our own understanding of ourselves, of coming to know ourselves as the original psychologist, one of the first psychologists, at least, uh, Plato and Socrates said, you know, know thyself. This inner journey, as well as this external sort of outward uh, expansive adventure, sort of manifest destiny of, of um, European man, uh, and, and which, which has continued now as this scientific adventure, you know, expanding out into space. These, these, these two uh, human, you know, modes of existence are both, I think, an expression of this underlying imaginative, imaginative capacity, you know, that binds together mind and matter and, and nature and spirit into a, a single creative process, right? That's the, the cosmological imagination, if you will. And it's in some sense subtends or it stands beneath and makes possible, it provides the ground for uh, what we call nature and what we call the self, what we call, you know, the physical universe and what we call the human psyche. These are, these are two sides of um, an ongoing self-unifying process, right? There are two poles in this process. And we can actually experience their, you know, the push and pull of this, this polar relationship. Um, we're always participating in it, but I think there are techniques that gain, allow us to gain access uh, to this polarity so that the old sort of enlightenment dualism that modern, modern people inherit uh, is dissolved. Right? And the alienation of the self from the world is healed.
at least that's that's the hope when you know we we come into right relationship with these these techniques these psychedelic techniques because they're powerful and like any powerful medicine uh, when used in unintelligent ways they can become poisons right just like this, the advance of science due to the progress of technology in the last few hundred years has been totally bound up in um, the military industrial uh, uh, complex. So you can't separate these two things. Um, so, yeah, my two cents on uh, psyche and cosmos and the imagination in between.